Well, we'll try to get started now into the rest of our introductory material. I know some of you will know about what I'm going to say, and yet I, I think it's still good to go through it since we're trying to engage in some sort of systematic approach to the study of the letter to, of Paul to the Romans. Um, I think it is good to remember that uh, in addition to this letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, he wrote other epistles. And uh, if he wrote Hebrews, then uh, there's 13 of them. If he didn't, there's 12 others besides Romans. So he wrote the majority of, of the New Testament. Having just finished the study of Acts, You'll remember that from Acts chapter 13 through the end of the book, chapter 28, then um, Luke devoted that whole space to Paul's work for the Lord. As he ends the book, you will notice, and I, keep, I say book and letter interchangeably, meaning you know the same thing that uh, Paul dictated this letter to a fellow by the name of Tertius. Uh, he was acting as his secretary, so he penned it for him. And then Paul signed it, as it were, to authenticate the letter, Romans chapter 16, verse 22. And you can see also the same in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 17. Um, you may say, well, if he dictated it to Tertius, then how can it be guaranteed to be infallible? Well, first of all, he's an apostle of Christ, and he wouldn't have affixed his name to it any more than any of us would have if he hadn't gone back over it after it was dictated. And besides that, God could have intervened in his providential care and caused it to be that way. Uh, Tertius himself could have had hands laid on him by Paul and had a, a gift, such as the gift of prophecy. Uh, I'd rather think that being moved and guided by the Holy Spirit, Paul dictated it and then went back through it and signed it. That's just a common sense approach to the whole thing, because if he put his name to it, then he's saying, this is mine. And when he said, this is mine, he was saying, this is a letter from an apostle of Jesus Christ. So that's the best way I would answer about the matter of Paul dictating the letter to Tertius, and yet it is from Paul and infallible as an apostle of Christ, he wrote it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Believing that for a moment, uh, looking at the city of Rome itself, I, I suppose there's no way for us to appreciate the position that the imperial city of Rome had for the Roman Empire. And even those peoples outside the Roman Empire uh, who never were taken over, still recognized how great a city Rome was. The saying that is still used to this day, all roads lead to Rome, was readily used at that time because as the Roman Empire was developed and the emperor stayed in Rome and before the emperor, the Senate was there, and in order to govern the empire as it became larger and larger, then they built uh, roads that even are still there to this day. Uh, I don't know that people build roads today as well as the Romans did. Uh, I won't try to go into it now, but uh, look up sometime either uh, on Google or somewhere that would deal with things like that, and they'll show you exactly how the Romans built a road, and you'll understand why it's still there 
and or at least there are many of them that are still still there to, to this day um, in way which is the way Paul came into Rome uh, is still being used uh, not from the standpoint of the whole thing being used like it was in Paul's day but a good part of it is still being used uh, so they knew how the Romans knew how to build they were the first uh, really nation that uh, used cement thus made concrete and so many of those things are standing today because they knew how to do that it's interesting to read how they made their concrete but that's neither here nor there with us except that it would explain to you why they were able to to have things last so long um, but these rulers ruled the civilized world there had to be a way that according to the technology of the day that information could be gotten back to them and out from them as quickly as possible uh, the population of rome is not well known uh, to be very exact it's thought of it was from somewhat just over a million between that and uh, over two million the estimates are but it was a very large city for that day and time whichever one of those numbers you want to take and at least or maybe i should say it this way fully one half of those who dwelled in rome were slaves and most of her people citizens of rome and i mean that those who lived in uh, rome proper lived off the public dole um, there was no middle class as we've come to think of it. There was only a handful of aristocrats who were more than billionaires for their day and time, billion with a B. And they control the wealth and they control the power of the city and the nation. And what you had in the place of what we think of as a middle class were tradesmen, people who owned their own private uh, businesses that many operated outside or out or within from within their houses that kind of thing but a middle class if we've come to know it uh, in the last three to four hundred years thereabouts and it might surprise people there hadn't been a middle class, middle class in the world uh, like we've known it except for the last three to four hundred years there was none at that time the city was on the Tiber River, and it was about 18 miles from the what's called the Tyrrhenian Sea. It was an inland sea. Now you go over there today, and you're not going to find it that way because of all the runoff and the buildup of silt, uh, silt and such stuff as that has moved the uh, place further away from the sea as far as the seashore is concerned. Um, we may have heard too the seven hills of Rome uh, that's what it was built on originally and right there was the beginning of Rome of the whole Roman Empire started there and then they began to to dominate until finally they had the whole Italian boot and from there they went on to conquer what we know as Roman Empire and um, if you look at Revelation chapter 17 and verse number nine, you'll see the idea presented in figurative language in the apocalyptic language of the book of Revelation, and it'll speak of seven hills, which is one reason we interpret that to have reference to Rome and uh, what that context in that passage was speaking of about Rome. When Paul um, wrote, then of course the city was like in its morals. You read up in Romans 1. And, and I suppose that shocks us because we just cannot root it out of our minds 
that along with paganism, the people had a choice of Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians, Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox. No, that none of that existed. They had a small group in contrast to the rest of the pagans that were Jews and even a much smaller group of Christians. The norm was paganism, and that's all they thought. So what you've got in Rome, what you have anywhere in the empire is paganism. It's the general way that the Gentiles live, and they'd lived that way for hundreds of years. So we need to keep that in mind and not think that they had all these choices. When you think of the government of these United States and how it developed uh, going back to the colonies and the colonies rooted in English common law and all of that, and they didn't have anything like that. The closest they had was in the history of the Greeks when they had their democracies. And uh, that is nothing to be compared with what we think of as a democratic government. Um, a true democracy has every citizen voting and uh, it is ruled by simple majority. Well, what does that do to the minority as far as their wishes and cares? 51% said we go this way, then what about the other 49%? That's the reason that finally you've got uh, the early beginnings of a republic and people don't know it because they know so very little about the government of the United States and that we have a republic. By the way, England never did have a republic and they still don't have a republic. And if you get into a, a, quite a discussion with people in the know about government in the UK, you'll find out that uh, while it's softened up to a great extent from what it was many years ago, there are people that still don't like Republic. And evidently, <laughs> it's getting to be more people here that don't like uh, a Republic. And that's coming out of just complete ignorance of what a republic does. And we're not going to get into it any more than that. But Rome, by this time, had left its republican days. And I don't mean as Republican Party. I mean it being a republic. It now was an empire with an emperor. So these people didn't think like we th think today. Uh, they don't view the world like we view it. They don't view deity like we view it. They, don't, they didn't think at all about death like we think of it. They didn't think at all about a final judgment where you stand before God to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, and the way you lived here puts you in eternal torment or else in eternal glory. Now, did they have punishment and things like that? Yes, in their views of spiritual things, they did. But none of it compared to what the gospel had to offer and the truth of the Bible. In fact, very little of it compared to the, the, uh, the Jews under the law of Moses. So you've got that kind of uh, life that was going on and that when you converted to Christianity that you still had the experience as far as being around it, there was a Roman satirist by the name of Juvenal. And he said himself, being a Roman, wrote that all the vices of all the nations flowed into imperial Rome as a common sink. So when you talk about modern day draining the swamp, it's not a new idea nor the view that the seat of certain governments is a swamp. So there's always been some swamp to form and some swamp to drain. And if the world lasts into the future for 5,000 more years or however long, that'll always be the case. There was a very large colony of Jews in Rome. We can see something about that from Acts chapter 18 and verse number two, Acts 18, verse two. 
But as far as the religion that dominated Rome, as I said, it was the same as dominated the whole empire and even those outside of the empire. Paganism and idolatry. That's what they were devoted to and all of its attendant evils. Um, it would take a whole college course just to study the various deities of the Romans and, uh, of course, the whole Gentile world. But it was in this paganism mindset that would not convert, that would not listen to the gospel. From them, from the time of Nero, and as Christianity grew, they were the ones that ended up getting the Roman government behind persecuting the Christians. So after, if you, when you're reading the book of Acts, you basically find the church persecuted by unbelieving Jews. And you got the appearance of the Christians who turned into Judaizing teachers. You have some of them on Paul's journeys to preach the gospel, stirring up some of the local Gentiles. But you don't have a united, concerted government effort to oppose Christianity. That came to pass after it became apparent that Christianity was not at all uh, a Jewish thing. Because once Jerusalem is destroyed and the temple gone and the controlling power of the Sanhedrin over the Jews, wherever they might be, was removed then Christianity flourished among the Gentiles between 70 and uh, on up until, if we're right, the book of Revelation was written in around 96, 97, and it was dealing with a empire-wide uh, persecution. And, of course, much of that persecution was based upon lies and innuendos and all such as that. Um, when I was in Rome, I went into uh, one of the old catacombs, which by the time uh, oh, of 200 and 250 along in there, uh, they were so persecuted and, that they had met in those catacombs, which were tombs. And uh, I remember seeing, and it was still painted very vividly, where somebody had uh, painted on the wall a person being crucified with the body of a human being nailed to a cross, but with the head of a donkey, which was just ridicule of, of Christianity. So you had all that kind of thing going on. And... Uh, in view of what's been going on recently, that gets kind of close to home, doesn't it? Uh, so every kind of cruel persecution was heaped upon members of the Lord's church. And it started, although it was limited at that time in Nero's day when he blamed the burning of Rome on the Christians. So that was the, after Paul's death or around the time of Paul's death. So everything we have, as I've said several times before, in the Bible, except for what um, covered in the book of Revelation, basically dealt with the history of the church up to A.D. 63 or 4 or somewhere like that. The church in Rome, at the time Paul wrote this letter, had not been visited by an apostle of Christ. I know that, uh, well, basically I know that. The evidence, I think, leans toward the, that fact because chapter 1 and verse 11, Paul said that he wanted to go to see them. He said, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. Now, that either says an apostle hadn't been there or else the church needed more miraculous gifts and Paul wanted to come as the apostle of the Gentiles and impart that gift. 
Um, the reason I say that is because usually the question that arises, well, how did the church begin in Rome? And we're limited to certain answers. One of them would be that those who were there on Pentecost from Rome, Jews, proselytes, and they're listed by Luke in Acts 2, that when they returned to Rome, they taught the gospel, but that they didn't have miraculous gifts because they didn't have an apostle there. Or else they had apostles' hands laid on them before they left Jerusalem, and Paul is saying, as I said a moment, as I said a moment ago, that he wanted to impart to them more gifts because those gifts would not be imparted unless an apostle did it. And if the church had been there for quite a number of years and no apostle had been there, possibly there were people there uh, or people who had had hands laid on them, if that was the case, that had died or left or whatever. But Paul still said, the fact is, I want to come there because I want to impart some spiritual gifts to you, period. As to the other part, that's about it. Um, now, it is, we know Priscilla and Aquila came into Asia, and Paul uh, converted them, chapter 16, verses 3 through 5. It's a possibility they went back at some time. But we know the gospel was committed to the church, and we know that wherever the church went, the faithful preached the gospel. So the gospel had, the seed of the kingdom had to be sown for it to germinate and produce Christians. So whether it was from people converted on Pentecost who went back to Rome, others converted later, Paul says, in this miraculous age, without a written, completed New Testament, I would like to impart some miraculous gifts to you, and I hope to come to be able to do that. It's hard again for us today to recognize that here they were Christians, Nobody had a written New Testament. I imagine that. You can't conceive of that nowadays. But that was the case. Also, when you look at this, uh, there is, I mentioned this, I think, last week. There's not any evidence whatsoever that Peter founded the church in Rome. Uh, the Roman Catholics say he did it in 44 AD. That's when they claim that Peter came there and did it. Well, it's interesting that when you read Romans, you see that uh, the church was composed of both Jewish and Gentile converts, chapter 1, verse 13, and chapter 7, verse 1. And they were a thriving group, and their faith, their obedience was known extensively, chapter 1 and verse number 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. How many congregations of God's people were in Rome? I don't know. Uh, we fail sometimes to understand that to talk about the church in Dallas or the church in Houston or the church wherever doesn't rule out the organizational structure of the church, which could mean a number of congregations. We do know that there was one congregation of God's people in Rome that met in the home of Priscilla and Aquila, chapter 16, verses 3 through 5. 16, 3 through 5. Now, if you've got a city as big as Rome, then you're apt to have more than one congregation. So, don't be fooled when you talk about the church in a given city. That doesn't mean one single solitary congregation in that city. You can't prove that by saying the church in a given city. No doubt it did start with one congregation, but that doesn't mean it stayed that way. And um, the church then would be existing even as it does today in its organizational structure and people would be able to assemble as they were able to travel and get around and get to the assembly. Well, they had more of a, of a situation to get to and from an assembly 
as was in America in the 19th century. So that must be considered and not be thought of as we would think about getting around today. In AD 63, according to Paul's letter to the Philippians, in Philippians 4 and verse 22, we learn, as I think I mentioned this last week, that there were saints in Caesar's household. And uh, American Standard translates that, the Praetorian Guard that I talked about last week. Now, all roads lead to Rome. Well, everything led to Rome, whether it was alien people who came for government purposes or for trade purposes. There was everything. It's dog and cat that was in Rome. So if that's the case, then the church there was uniquely situated to teach the people that came there, stayed a while, and then went back home. That is another reason that by AD 62, when the Ephesian letter, or rather the Colossians was written, that twice Paul says, gospel's been preached to the world. Uh, it didn't mean that everybody had had our own Bible study, but it meant the opportunity for them to have heard and learned the gospel had been made available to them. And you can see with situations like Paul in his own hired house and his first imprisonment, free to take anybody coming in and out as a visitor, knowing his evangelistic zeal, his love for the Lord, and his teaching of everybody that is converted ought to seek to convert somebody else, then there is no telling how many people were reached with the gospel, and Rome was a unique situation to be able to spread the gospel. For a little bit, let's talk about what I introduced a moment ago, and that is the Roman Catholic claim that Peter started the church there in 44 A.D., at least some of their scholars claimed that he founded the church at that time, and of course, he would be the first pope, according to Roman Catholic dogma, and that he served in that capacity until he was put to death. There's, there is simply no historical evidence that Peter founded a congregation of God's people. The claim rests solely on legend. There's no way that you could begin stepping outside of the scriptures or remaining with the scriptures, prove that Peter started the church there, especially in 44. Now let's, let's look at this for a moment. They claim, as I said, many of their scholars do, that Peter, as they claim him being the first pope, started the church in Rome. But now what's interesting when you begin to study, and this will take us back to the book of Acts, and you'll remember the conference at Jerusalem that's recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 15, where they met to find out who started this false doctrine of the Judaizing teachers. And in Acts 15 and uh, we're able to determine that was at about 49, around 49 in the first century. Peter was in Jerusalem and was involved in that conference. It's also interesting if the church at that time and the other apostles viewed Peter the way the Roman Catholics teach him to be, that if he had been in Rome, in such an exalted office as the Roman Catholics um, exalt the office of the Pope, the See of St. Peter. It's difficult for me to understand that Paul could write a, a letter and not mention Peter at all. And he wrote this letter after 44 AD. Now, if Peter had been there, this makes kind of a problem uh, when it comes to Paul's work. 
Paul had a goal of not building on another's foundation. And yet, if he had gone there, I know he said he wanted to go there to impart a miraculous gift on his way to Spain. That was his plans. But Paul likes going to a place where the gospel has never been heard and sow the seed of the kingdom and convert people to Christ. And that would pose a bit of a problem. At least it seems to me it could. If uh, Paul had gone there to convert people, doesn't mean he couldn't have taught them more about being Christians. I'm not saying that. But you have to reconcile that with the fact that Paul says he was not going to build on another man's foundation. And if Peter had built the church there, it established it in AD 44, there would have been some problem there along Paul following that route. He wouldn't want to continue evangelistic work there, building on another's foundation. In this case, if Roman Catholicism is right, that would be Peter. Now, I pointed out that Paul desired to impart unto the church, members of the church, some spiritual gift, verse 11 of chapter 1. We know that, as I said earlier, only apostles could lay hands on members of the church and impart those gifts, Acts 8, verses 14 through 17. Acts 8, 14 through 17. Now, Peter's an apostle too. Peter had the same baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit that Paul did and the rest of the apostles did. If Peter started this church in AD 44, as the Roman Catholics claim, why would there be a need for Paul to make this trip to lay hands on them to impart a gift? Wouldn't Peter, who established the congregation, have given them those spiritual gifts? The wisdom that any apostle had from God came through the Holy Spirit so that the church could continue steadfastly in whose doctrine? The apostles' doctrine. Why? Because the Holy Spirit infallibly guided them with the truth. So why do you need Paul there to impart a miraculous gift? Peter's been there since AD 44. That's almost 20 years before Paul ever got there. And before the time that the Roman Catholics say that Peter was martyred there. So that doesn't make too good a sense to me. Now, as to whether he ever went to Rome or not, I don't know. He could have. All I'm saying is I don't know of any evidence of any kind whatsoever that even hints at Peter being in Rome. Uh, so we try to go strictly on the evidence. Even in the case of secular history, you try your best to go on the extent evidence available to form your views of what happened wherever, you're, wherever it happened in past time and space, which is the definition of history. If you have any questions on those things, feel free to jot them down. We'll consider them. But I'll leave that right now and go to the book itself. We think it was written, if you read all that there is to uh, read on it, that I know anything about. And you don't have to read everything to see most of it. You know, sometimes when you read a book, you get the benefit of what a lot of other people read because whoever wrote that book quotes from a number of other people. But be that as it may, we think the book was written just before Paul departed from Jerusalem. Um, with the fund for the poor, the benevolent fund, we would call it, for the needy saints in Jerusalem, Judea, and that area, Acts 15, 25 through 26, or Romans 15, I'm sorry, Romans 15, 25 through 26. And that's also, as far as that collection is concerned, is what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and in um, 2 Corinthians 8, chapters 8 and 9. Uh, we think it was written from Corinth, and we think it was written while he was staying with Gaius. A couple of G-A-I-S, we some say Gaius, but literally it's Gaius, uh, who was Paul's host. <laughs> 
in Corinth. Acts 20, verses 1 through 3. Acts chapter 21 through 3. Romans 16, verse 23. And 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14. Romans 16, 23. And 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14. Um, Phoebe was the one, as best we can tell, who delivered the letter. She was from Sincrea, C-E-N-C-H-R-E-A, Sincrea. And Sincrea is near to the city of Corinth, chapter 16, verse 1. The date of the writing was somewhere around 55 to 56 A.D. And, of course, the name of it is just simply the name of the people to whom it was sent in the sense of the people of the church at Rome. What was the occasion? Well, he wrote them as he was thinking about purposing and planning to visit Rome itself. And it seems that he was preparing them with this letter, with the information in it, so he could better work among them. I use the word it seems. There's no way to know absolutely. But these people did not just operate helter-skelter. They did things decently and in order, and it was Paul by the Holy Spirit who wrote that to the church at Corinth. That's the way the Lord wants his work done, decently and in order. So proper plans and proper preparation would have been made. And from Rome as a base, it's obvious that he intended to journey other places, and one of them he specifically names. I mentioned it already, and that's Spain, chapter 15 and verse 28. Chapter 15, verse 28. Now, Paul wrote this with the realities of the church at that time. So he not only had to think about the unbelieving Jews who might bother him, but there were those in the church. The Judaizing teachers were hot on Paul's heels to discredit him as an apostle of Christ. He was interested in refuting that Judaizing faction because they were hindering his work. So he sets forth a lot of detail and good material concerning the law of Moses and the law system and the gospel system. He is anticipating what the Judaizing teachers might do and he's answering them to put a block up before them and to forewarn the church there. And also to be able to say the truth before those detractors got their shots in. This reminds me much of what brother, the late brother G.K. Wallace told me concerning public debates. He said, most of our brethren who debate would like to have the negative in the debate because the, de the negative in the debate gets the final say. But he said he always liked to have the affirmative, the first affirmative in the debate because it let him set the issue before anybody could muddy the waters. And uh, I think that's a good point. As to all of the purposes of Paul's writing the letter to the church at Rome, it had to fit in to the realities of that time and Paul's situation in the church. And he was interested in getting the churches everywhere because he knew these letters that he wrote would circulate among the churches. They would be apostolic declarations in the church. Those who were faithful would view them as such. Thus, the problem between Gentile and Jewish converts needed to be ironed out. Thus, you have it as it set out, and we mentioned this some time ago, 
when he shows you in Romans chapter 1, as we have it, the departure of the Gentiles from God, not designed to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them up to do all those wicked things they were still doing at the time he wrote the letter. Then when you get to Romans chapter 2, he addresses the Jews who had the oracles of God committed unto them, and what did they do? Well, they rejected it. They rebelled against it. They wouldn't follow it. And thus, in Romans chapter 3, he concludes all, both Jew and Gentile, under sin, and therefore in need of the gospel system so they could be saved. Thus, we see, is making that clear, which was not clear in the minds of a lot of people and Judaizing teachers didn't try to make it clear. They were interested in making the Gentiles like proselytes in the church. Paul felt a very keen sense of obligation to preach the gospel in Rome from the standpoint of edifying the church. Now, there was a while ago, it goes back, well, it goes back to the 50s and 40s and so on, to where there were those who taught there was a difference in gospel and doctrine. That you preach the gospel to the unbeliever, the alien sinner, and you teach doctrine to the church. But gospel and doctrine are one and the same thing, and those terms are used interchangeably to refer to the same thing. To preach the gospel is to teach the doctrine of Christ. To teach the doctrine of Christ is to preach the gospel. Now, they argue that, and some still do, to try to say, see, the church can't support a preacher full-time to preach the gospel to it because you only preach the gospel to the person outside the church. That's where the anti-located preacher doctrine came in. And that was, uh, that held sway and caused problems in the church many, many years ago. And yet it's interesting that the liberals took it and pointed out that, well, you can fellowship anybody if they're obedient to the gospel. Well, you have to make them define what they mean by gospel. And finally, Carl Ketcher's side said, well, it only means that a person believes in Christ as the Son of God. Anything else falls in the area of doctrine. We're to be united on gospel. We'll never be united on doctrine. So they made a distinction the New Testament does not make between gospel and doctrine. So it's interesting that those who opposed a preacher preaching the gospel to an established church thus were binding where God had not bound, actually were using what the liberals would use to justify fellowshipping those who had not fully obeyed the gospel in believing in Christ, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Christ, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and then fellowshipping according to the doctrine of the New Testament on whatever component part is obligatory on us in order to be faithful to God in his son's church. So there's always somebody coming up from somewhere that's going to be striving to drive a wedge either to bind where God has not bound, such as the Judaizing teachers, or to loose men from what God has bound on them by his authoritative word. There will never be a time we will not have to be very sure how the New Testament authorizes, and how we ascertain that authority of our Lord from his last will and testament, and then examine all things in the light of his authority. He's the sovereign king. We're not. His word is law. Our word is. What we do is learn how to study the Bible and rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, that we can know what he's authorized. And when we know what he's authorized and it's obligatory, then our duty is to learn it, to keep it, to teach it, to defend it, and discharge our duty. We have no right to change it. 
but there's two ways that you get people away from the doctrine. Either you teach something that binds on man what the Bible does not, or you teach a doctrine that looses him from what God and his word binds on us. Every false doctrine falls into one of those two. So we need to know just how those things operate. Why Paul was so concerned about two things in his life, preaching the gospel to as many people as he possibly could who had never heard it, and then keeping the church faithful to the Lord. I'm amazed at people who can be so zealous to get the gospel out to those who have never heard it, aren't too concerned at all about those who have heard it and obeyed it and keeping them faithful to the Lord. I don't see that the New Testament says one is of any less important than the other. Why well, get them baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and faithful children of God and then forget about them or pay no attention to what they believe once they become Christians because they were baptized, weren't they? Well, most of the New Testament was written to those who were baptized to keep them walking the straight and narrow way of the truth for the Lord's church. So the book sets out to the believers in Rome the fundamentals of salvation. Just look at Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and salvation, and go all the way through chapter 8, verse 39, Romans 1.16 through chapter 8, verse 39, and you'll see him bearing down hard on the fundamentals of the faith. He wants to show that both Jews and Gentiles were guilty of sin, as I said, and therefore they both stood condemned. And that they could never be justified by a law system. And thus, without Christ, they were hopelessly lost. He wrote to set forth God's plan of righteousness in Christ where he located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. And it's only in Christ that we are justified in God's sight. He wanted to show the effect of Adam's sin on the human race in that Adam opened the door for Satan to get into the world, and then we sin by our own choice. And he wanted to show the great eternal benefits which Christ's death brought to all men. And that's about as fundamental as you can get. He wanted to explain the unbelief of Israel and their relationship to the gospel. And he does that in chapters 9 through 11. Chapters 9 through 11. And in writing the letter, he wanted to encourage the disciples to be faithful to the Lord, to live the Christian life, chapter 12. You see him getting into that in uh, chapter 6. He wanted to remind them of their duty of peaceable submission to the Roman government, chapter 13. I want to pause here and stop, but I want to end by elaborating more on Romans chapter 13. Consider the kind of government that ruled the Roman Empire. Consider the caliber of the senators, of the generals, of the emperors. And yet in Romans 13, he teaches to be obedient to that civil government. And the only reason you have before God to disobey civil government is if they make rulings it calls you by obeying them to violate God's law. And that's the only reason anybody can disobey a civil law and not sin before God. We're going to have to do some serious thinking of the Lord's church and the way that things are going in this country regarding the government and regarding the Christian's response to a heathen bunch. And if you're going to learn how to do that from the inspired word of the living God that means now as it will mean on the day of judgment, then you can't find it better than what was written by Paul and the other apostles, the Christians, 
who lived under that despotic government that was the Roman Empire. To learn what we do, how we do it, that's very important. So I want to begin then, the Lord willing, next week, where we're leaving off here with Romans 13, and then continue to bring out some other things in the letter that he was dealing with to show the fundamentals of the faith. And by the way, it's interesting that Romans 13 is instruction concerning the Christian's uh, view of civil government was considered to be fundamental and basic to Christian living. So therefore, it is for us today. And we must be very careful how we approach things along that line when it comes to civil government. Okay, we'll stop here. And then we, the Lord,